Hey, 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 everybody. Thanks for checking out the RCWR show. Show the ultimate fan support and follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at the RCWR show for original merchandise from the mind and hands of yours truly and friends. Head over to cafepress.com forward slash rcwr show go to that next wrestling or concert event in style that's cafepress.com forward slash rcwr show and visit infinity one productions.com the exclusive home for new and exclusive original content such as our 30 with lee series bonus rcwr show episodes and much much more infinity one productions.com that's with an e as in edward put in the actual number one infinity one productions.com morning the rcwr show with lee sanders is intended for a mature audience only the following is an infinity one productions presentation keeping it honest insightful and interactive covering the latest in wrestling entertainment and beyond since 2011, you're listening to the RCWR Show. Now, your host, live from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., Lee Sanders. What's going on, everybody? Lee Sanders here. This is your WWE No Mercy. Call that match edition. For those of you that may be new to this series, this is pretty much our match prediction edition. Where I kick on back and offer my thoughts, my opinions on how I would book certain matches for some of your favorite wrestling pay-per-views. As always, I appreciate the great feedback, love and support. Really appreciate y'all coming through, checking out the website for your exclusive audio content. So, without any further ado, let's get to it, man. And as always, make sure you stay connected to me all throughout social media. I'll do those plugins later on, trust me. So, this is the 12th annual WWE No Mercy event, but this is the very first No Mercy event since 2008. This go-round, we are finding No Mercy under the SmackDown brand. It's going to be coming to us from the Golden One Center venue in Sacramento, California. This should be a pretty interesting pay-per-view event, let me tell you. We got a pretty good solid card, quite honestly. Off the break, for a pre-show match, we have Jack Swagger taking on Baron Corbin. I'm actually okay with the placement of this particular match because, quite honestly, it just really has not been gelling that well between these two guys. I know they've been doing a little bit of something on SmackDown the past couple of weeks, but the fans just read off of their reactions. They could really care less. If you ask me straight up, Lee, do you care about this match at all? No, I do not care about this match at all. I think if there was any part of me that may have been remotely interested in this match, it went out the window from the moment that these two guys locked up the very first time on SmackDown a couple of weeks back. I'm thinking if not two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago at most. But I think also what really jumped out at me was the fact that we had Jack Swagger, who when we last saw on WWE Raw, lost to tickle my you-know-what, Jinder Mahal. I'll try to keep it clean for you guys. Now what the hell? It's on my website. I can get away with it. Tender my balls. That's who he <laughs> And when he lost to Jinder Mahal, in all seriousness though, that was pretty much it for him. Then when we see him on the SmackDown brand, we're kind of going, oh, well, maybe this is going to be the new start of something new for Jack Swagger. You know, he had accomplished good success when he was on SmackDown, when he made his debut in the WWE, came on up through the SmackDown brand all those years back. Okay, so kind of getting back to basics. Maybe we're going to find him kind of doing that. Maybe this is going to be a new Jack Swagger. And... Man, were we disappointed. Came out to the same entrance, came out to the same in-ring gear, didn't do anything new in the ring. This feud with Baron Corbin, uh, honestly, I could really care less about this. If you want to do something with both of these guys, 
Honestly, why not just make them a tag team? Why not pin them against the other tag teams? Have them go for the tag team division? Because honestly, I just really don't see anything you could do with these guys on a long-term basis. This is a very interesting situation, though, because you're looking at Jack Swagger. And then you're looking at Baron Corbin. I never really thought I'd see the day where Baron Corbin would be in a position where he'd be doing a little bit more pre-show openers and not actually be on the actual card itself. And it just seems as though his stock is really taking a nosedive or it has been. Seems like nowadays it really doesn't matter that he had won this past year's Andre the Giant Battle memorial match does it gotta pick a winner out of this one honestly because i have the strangest feeling that this is probably gonna just keep going i'm looking at baron corbin whether it's a situation where the referee gets distracted baron corbin does like a poke to the eye or the guy just fights dirty like that that's his mo or maybe while the ref is distracted maybe he gives a nice Strong, stiff kick to the groin of Jack Swagger. Sets up end of days. I just see Baron Corbin doing some pretty interesting shenanigans to pick up the W over Swagger. But I'm looking at Baron Corbin for the win. Next matchup, we have Kurt Hawkins making his SmackDown debut. We're not really sure right now who he's going to be taking on. I couldn't help but kick on back and look at the entire SmackDown roster. And one name that kind of jumps out at me, but right now he is inactive. And he should be inactive for a couple of more months. Is Shelton Benjamin, who as you all know was supposed to be making his debut on the SmackDown brand. But he ended up becoming inactive as a result of needing surgery on on his shoulder so he's going to be out for the foreseeable future but other than that as far as any other names that kind of jump out at me right now i'm really not seeing any other names i'm looking at the roster i don't see anybody do you maybe bring back fandango fandango is somebody that was drafted to the smackdown brand we haven't seen him in a good minute, so do you maybe put him on there? It's very well possible. Or do you maybe put Apollo Crews in there? Apollo Crews is someone that uh, we quietly have been seeing kind of here and there on SmackDown, but when you look at this card, he's not on here. So do you maybe have Kurt Hawkins take on Apollo Crews? I kind of have the impression maybe that's the direction you go. Or do you maybe go in the direction of Kane? So kind of interesting. I mean, when I really think about this particular match, it's obvious that Kurt Hawkins is being used as comic relief. And he's definitely coming off as someone that is going to be a utility player, meaning he's going to be put in a position where he's going to be putting other people over. Now, I'm just going with typical WWE logic in a situation like this. I could see Kurt Hawkins cutting a promo, hyping up the fact that he's finally in the WWE, putting himself over, putting some type of an open challenge out there. I could even see a scenario come about where the segment just ends up becoming the drizzling shits and the fans just want to be put out of their misery already. And I could see Kane, who's basically as of late been acting like the Sandman from Showtime at the Apollo, coming out, choke slamming his ass. That's pretty much it. I know, very typical, very cliche, that really comes off like something you should be seeing on the damn TV, right? I totally agree with that, which is why maybe you should go in a direction where instead you have an actual match and maybe you put Kurt Hawkins over. Me personally, I like Apollo Crews. The guy is only going to get better when you keep putting him out there in the wolves, when you keep putting him out there under the spotlight. I personally would like to see Apollo Crews take on Kurt Hawkins. I got Kurt Hawkins another fuck you over match. Uh, I, I see another scenario coming about where Kurt Hawkins is going to go low. He's going to go dirty. Maybe he wins via roll up. Nice handful of tights. 
But for me personally, I don't mind seeing Kurt Hawkins and Apollo Crews get it on. I just hope that old man Kane does not come out. And I think now that I've laid this all out. But when it's all said and done, I see Kurt Hawkins, Apollo Crews. That would be the better matchup instead of Sandman Kane. I think we can all be in agreement of that. And hey, look, if it turns out the Sandman Kane does come out Sunday... Hate to say I told you so, but in either case, I'm looking at Kurt Hawkins for a W. Next matchup, we got Nikki Bella taking on Carmella. These two girls have been going at it past couple of weeks. I like the fact that WWE bookers are trying to do what they can with Carmella. Carmella still, she's, she's getting there. She's improving just a little bit, but that young girl still has a long ways to go. I have nothing personal against her, but there really needs to be a new change in her gimmick already. She just seems so freaking lost in the shuffle. In ring action wise, I would have to say, unlike Dana Brooke, Carmella's actually doing pretty decent in the ring. Quite honestly, I think this feud that she's been having with Nikki Bella has been helping moderately, moderately uh, to a degree and having her connect more with the WWE universe. Nikki Bella, Carmella. I just see, for some reason, this entire event kind of like almost being a night of fuck finishes. And that's probably going to be something that's going to piss off a lot of people. But I, I just kind of see it going in that direction. I'm definitely not seeing Nikki Bella picking up the win uh, in this matchup. I feel that the brass that bees in the WWE, they're still playing around with Carmella. They still have high expectations for her. I think Carmella needs this win more than Nikki Bella does. Now, I understand that Nikki Bella came back not too long ago, but you know what? When she initially came back, she was pretty much thrown into the fire of things, not to mention one thing that we need to make sure we make a note of is the fact that Eva Marie, whose suspension should be up by now, she should be returning. If I'm booking things right personally and I'm trying to do what I can to try to help Carmella get over, I would actually have Eva Marie pop up in this match. That way, Nikki Bella and Eva Marie can somewhat kind of resume their program, so to speak. But honestly, the way I'm kind of looking at this match, I think it'd be a good back and forth. But right when it looks like Nikki Bella is finally going to get the job done, I can just hear that PA announcer that be setting up Eva Marie doing the proper introduction and everything. Hear the music. Eva Marie comes out. Nikki Bella's like, what the hell? I can see something interesting like that coming about where Carmella takes advantage of that distraction, picks up the W, and then that's how you can pretty much just throw Eva Marie right back into the fold of things. And then going forward, I think it makes a lot of sense to have Carmella and Eva Marie kind of rub off of one another. I think it would definitely help with Carmella's development a bit further if you pair her up with Eva Marie, that girl gets instant heat just by popping up. I think it makes a lot of good sense to try to have Carmella be in a position where she can kind of capitalize on that. The brass that be in WWE doing a good job by having Carmella work with Nikki Bella. But don't be too surprised if in the coming weeks, beginning with Sunday's No Mercy, Eva Marie gets thrown into it just to season it up a little bit more but regardless i'm looking at carmella for the win randy orton taking on bray wyatt you know we've seen these guys lock up a few times over the years but this is a really fun interesting program that's coming about right now uh, with these two guys i'm paying attention to this particular match for a lot of reasons one of the reasons why i'm looking at it I think whoever wins this match will be able to make the argument that they should be named the number one contender to take on the WWE champion. That is really how I'm looking at this match right here. And right now, 
I love the fact that WWE, they're trying to do what they can with both of these guys. Seems like they kind of have newfound appreciation, newfound faith with Bray Wyatt. If it was me personally, I would love to see Bray Wyatt go over in this match. I really, really would because now I feel more than ever Bray Wyatt is in that position where he doesn't have any, I don't want to say baggage, but he doesn't have anything extra around him as far as an Eric Rowan, as far as a Luke Harper or a Braun Strowman. Now it's just basically back to basics. And when it's all said and done, I honestly would not be that surprised if in the coming months, the Bray Wyatt family starts to extend a little bit to the point where Bray Wyatt gets himself a new entourage. Keeping all that in mind, I'm looking at Randy Orton. Love Randy Orton. Love Randy Orton. Past couple of times he's been coming back from hiatuses. It just seems like Randy Orton is just oozing out more machizo, more gusto, and I'm really loving it. I'm really appreciating it from Randy Orton, but... I'm just looking at the bigger picture going forward. I like the idea of a Randy Orton chasing after the WWE champion as opposed to Bray Wyatt. Sadly, Bray Wyatt is still getting a lot of what chance. People just are not interested in his promos as they used to be. I think WWE is doing a really good job going back to basics with Bray Wyatt doing the nice creepy little backstage vignettes they're on the right path to kind of like hey this is why you all fell in love with Bray this is why you all messed with him from the get-go and I think WWE needs to continue that course with Bray Wyatt so far as how this match can end I honestly would hate to see a clean finish come about uh, in this matchup, but I think this is probably going to be y your first official match of the night where you do get a clean finish. I can see Randy Orton defeating Bray Wyatt, but I can see a scenario coming about where these two uh, continue on. I don't know if it continues on that respected week SmackDown, but I can definitely see these two guys continuing it on. But again, with regards to this matchup, I think the winner of this can lay claim that they should be the number one contender to face the WWE champion. And I'm going with Randy Orton to slide into that picture. Meanwhile, Heath Slater and Rhino, they are taking on the Usos for the WWE SmackDown tag titles. I did not see Slater and Rhino winning the tag titles at the last SmackDown pay-per-view event, but somehow they managed to pull it off. I felt that the Usos should have gotten it back then because it just made more sense given what they did to the American Alpha. Just kind of seemed like that was the perfect setup, but I just kind of personally feel as though Slater and Rhino have lost a little bit of their mojo because I like the running gag that you had going on with Slater and everything. Win this match, you'll get your contract. Seemed like they had a really good thing going on. Almost kind of reminded me of Eric Young in TNA Wrestling, uh, Don't Fire Eric or whatever like that. Uh, it almost kind of had shades of that. It almost kind of had shades of the Brooklyn Brawler always losing his matches up until he got to uh, that one infamous victory. I think everybody remembers that one very well. But, you know, for me, I, I think the honeymoon is over for Slater and Rhino. And I still am a firm believer that you put the tag titles on the Usos, you let American Alpha try to chase after them and they keep getting denied tag title shots tag title shots tag title shots left and right uh, until finally uh, they're given the opportunity I don't know if maybe that comes from the general manager or what but I still believe that a heel Usos with the tag titles working with American Alpha for those belts that's definitely the way you want to go. But on this night, I'm still a firm believer. I, I, I like the Usos. I like the Usos. Becky Lynch defends the SmackDown Women's title against Alexa Bliss. I have been a fan of Alexa Bliss 
since her tenure in NXT. And I've been telling you guys left and right, this young girl could possibly be your next Trish Stratus. And I'm telling you, she has so far, when you just look at the resume, who all she's represented, how she's been coming about, she is going in that direction. She is a cute little small firecracker, man. I am really loving her. And this would probably be my shocker of the night. I love Becky Lynch. Don't get me wrong. Love that girl. But there is something white hot in a bottle right now that Alexa Bliss has going on. And I think it's connecting very well uh, with the WWE fan base. If there was a shocker of the night, man... Becky Lynch losing that SmackDown title, uh, I, I really feel that could be a direction that you go in. Now, there's also a part of me that's strongly considering that Becky Lynch is probably being put in the position of being SmackDown Women's Champion just so eventually she can work a program with Eva Marie who will take that women's title. When it's all said and done, Alexa Bliss will be a SmackDown Women's Champion down the road, but not on this night. I just have the strangest feeling that when it's all said and done, Eva Marie is going to slide on in there. If it was up to me personally, I would love Alexa Bliss to go over Sunday as your new SmackDown Women's Champion. She just connects well. She's got it all down. I, I love it. She's got it all down. Becky Lynch, not to piss on Becky Lynch fans, but there is something about Becky Lynch. I can't quite put my finger on it, but there is something lacking with Becky Lynch. I don't know if maybe she needs to be in a position where she's chasing after the title and she's chasing after it in like a big, big way. I think that big, big way, that big payoff could come from a Eva Marie. So this one, you, you got me, guys. I'm a little bit on the fence on this one, but I'm going to say Becky Lynch is going to retain. Remember how it was when Eva Marie was around before her suspension? I mean, she was like the female Kevin Owens. She had her hand dipped into a little bit of everything uh, as far as rivalries go, so... Don't be too surprised if she also tries to pick things up with Becky Lynch as well. Title versus career match for the WWE Intercontinental title. If Dolph Ziggler loses, he must retire. This is going to be a match that a lot of people are going to be talking about, myself included. I've been talking about this with coworkers and friends all week long. I'm very curious to see how this match comes about. I watched SmackDown this week. I never did hear Daniel Bryan say that Maurice was banned from ringside. So I would imagine that before this match starts, with such high stakes on the line, I would imagine that Maurice would be banned from ringside. I would imagine that would come about right before the bell rings for this match. For it not to come about would just be really silly. Now, if they've already addressed that, on SmackDown, let me know through social media, guys, because obviously I, I like probably missed it. But far as I could tell, they haven't even made that announcement yet. So hopefully they plug that gap going into Sunday. But a lot of people are under the impression that Dolph Ziggler is going to win this match. It's a foregone conclusion because it's title versus career. Why wouldn't he come out on top? But you know something? When I just take a step back... I add up certain things. One thing that jumps out in my mind right now is the fact that Dolph Ziggler, whether you love the guy or you hate him, you look at the tenure that he has held on to that Intercontinental title. Let's really expand on this. You realize to date, to date, Miz has held on the longest to a WWE title other than the New Day. New Day is first place. Miz is number two. Just for a singles title, Miz is number one. But if you're just going to look in general, he's number two. So, yeah, I think for me, given the fact that you got that going on, you also look at all the promoting that Miz and WWE have been doing throughout social media, hyping up the fact of how long he's been holding on to that IC title. 
combine that with the great quality of work that The Miz has been delivering week in and week out. He has been a really good Intercontinental Champion. And quite honestly, Daniel Bryan is getting his wish. I don't see enough people talking about this. Remember what Daniel Bryan has said right before he went out on injury and all that? Basically, what he would like to do with that Intercontinental title. He said that he would love to be in a position where if the draft had returned, he would just basically be exclusive to SmackDown. Or if he could have it his way, he would just stay exclusive to the SmackDown brand with the IC title. Bring back prestige to that IC title. Let there be lengthy title reigns and all that. And I think WWE is taking the page out of Daniel Bryan's playbook. And they're going, you know what? That was a really solid idea you had. Let's go ahead. Let's go with that. Guys, when it's all said and done, I've got The Miz retaining that IC title. When it's all said and done. Uh, I'm just picturing The Miz without the Intercontinental title. And it's kind of like, okay, well, what direction... Do you go with him? Do you put him in a position where you have him face Dolph Ziggler again? I don't really think so. To have Miz lose to Dolph Ziggler, it's like, what do you do with the Miz? Honestly, let's look at it like this. If Miz were to lose the Intercontinental title, he would be in a serious doghouse with Daniel Bryan. I would imagine he would definitely be in breach of his contract to an extent because he no longer has the IC title and when you're in the position where you have that IC title at least the way it's been playing off of uh, past several weeks of WWE Smackdown programming uh, he has all the bargaining chips to a degree in his favor so I, I don't see even though I would love it I'm not really seeing a situation just yet where Miz just night after losing the IC title he just goes skyrocketing to the main event picture facing whoever is holding on to that WWE world title. I I'm not seeing it just yet. I think Miz has a lot more fuel left in the tank as an IC champion. And what better way to really get this guy over and really get him hated amongst the IWC, amongst the Dolph Ziggler hardcore fans than to have him take out Dolph Ziggler. Combine that with the rumblings that Dolph Ziggler is possibly done with the WWE as far as in-ring competition goes. That WWE strongly wants him to move on in the next phase of his life and basically be a backstage producer slash agent. I am all fine uh, with that. Plus, the man is 36 years of age. He can always get back in the ring a year or two later when people have forgotten all about him. So honestly, I I'm really liking the idea of The Miz uh, retaining. I would like to see a scenario come about where just for one night only, no Maurice, no shenanigans, Miz just wins straight up one, two, three. One, two, three, Miz wins. I just have the strangest feeling that that's probably going to be the case. I mean, you think about these title versus career matches that we've had over the years. Very seldom have you seen a fuck finish. You feel where I'm coming from? Now, if they were to break that tradition and have the Miz, I, I think that would just solidify him even more as a heel. I got Miz retaining the IC title. One more match to talk about, and that is AJ Styles taking on Dean Ambrose. Taking on John Cena, triple threat match for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Triple threat match. Very interesting dynamics going on right here. Look, this is real simple. It's really, really simple. And hate to bust that bubble for fans, but in case you haven't been paying attention to your entertainment headlines, John Cena, he's getting ready to go on a little bit of a hiatus probably after no mercy or a week or two afterwards because he's got to go run off and film the second season of that Fox uh, TV series uh, that he's doing right now. I like saying True Grit, even though that's not the name of the damn show. Uh, that's actually the name of one of my favorite John Wayne movies. But I believe this series is called American Grit. 
And if I'm wrong on that, just correct me throughout social media. Look, reason why I don't know that name like that is because I don't watch the show. But I am just really, really picturing a scenario coming about that night. John Cena, yeah, he's not going to be a WWE champion on that night. Dean Ambrose, the Kingpin, yeah, I'm just... AJ is the way to go. AJ is still white hot right now. Uh, I'm, I'm really liking AJ Styles, the phenomenal one. I think this is clear cut. It's clear cut. I, I do not see a title change in this main event match. I just do not see it happening. I could definitely see a scenario come about where perhaps AJ Styles and Dean Ambrose, they probably tag team on John Cena. I could definitely see a scenario coming about like that. I think that's really the story that you need to tell in this match is John Cena did not become a WWE champion because it was basically two on one throughout this match. John Cena was being denied all those close calls, all those opportunities where it looked as though he could have been a WWE champion. So many near falls. I could see that because you got AJ Styles and Dean Ambrose both hating the hell out of John Cena. So definitely a very interesting dynamic uh, going into this matchup. I just really would not be that surprised if that's the story that they told with this matchup. And then AJ Styles, once he and Dean Ambrose does the dirty work on John Cena, AJ turns on Dean or Dean turns on AJ. Uh, But between the two of them, they try to get a near fall on each other. John Cena breaks it up. I, I just see all that coming about. When it's all said and done, though, as far as like who's getting the pen, I'm not seeing John Cena getting the pen. I could see some type of a scenario come about where uh, maybe Dean Ambrose does dirty deeds or, or something to AJ and it takes him out. Uh, he's getting ready to like go for the pen. John Cena pulls him off. Uh, John Cena grabs him, uh, tries to go for maybe the attitude adjustment, and it's a near fall. Looked as though there might have been a new WWE champion crown. John Cena's frustrated, trying to figure out what the hell does he have to do. John Cena could then try to go for the STF. Looks as though Dean Ambrose is about to tap uh, tap out. But then AJ Styles just comes, breaks it up, grabs John Cena, you know, maybe throws him out the ring, tries to go for the near fall. But uh, I I see something weird coming about where somebody's going to do a finisher on one person, another person's going to do a finisher on the other person, and the other person's going to take advantage, uh, pick up the sloppy seconds by knocking off that other person that did the finisher out the way and picking it up that way. That's really how I see it all coming about. But with regards to No Mercy, once again, your winners, I've got Kurt Hawkins over, I believe, Apollo Crews, Carmella over Nikki Bella, maybe with a little bit of help from Eva Marie, Randy Orton over Bray Wyatt, Heath Slater, Rhino, I got them losing the tag titles to the Usos, Becky Lynch retains her WWE SmackDown Women's title. Miz retains his title and what I hope will be a very controversial finish just to kind of break the tradition of title versus career. Let's not forget Swagger Corbin. Uh, I'm looking at Baron Corbin. World title. I'm looking at AJ for the retain. Hey, don't forget this Sunday night live on Spreaker.com. That's Sunday, October 9th. Despite the fact that we're going to have the presidential debate, we're going to have football, and we're also going to have a pay-per-view, the RCWR Show will be live on Spreaker covering WWE No Mercy Fallout, so make sure you check that out. It's going to be our WWE No Mercy After Show. We'll be coming on at 10.50 p.m. Eastern or immediately after the event concludes, live on Spreaker.com. I'll be kicking back, interacting with you all, covering the fallout. Providing fun, colorful analysis the way you all have come to know and appreciate it. Love it. As always, you can follow me throughout social media. I'm on Twitter at the RCWR Show. Facebook, same name. I'm also on Periscope, Vine, Instagram. I'm all over the place, man. Use the keywords, the RCWR Show. And if you like what I do for you guys, you're appreciating the extra content. And if you are in a position where you can donate 
to the show uh, to help with the expense costs, website, server, all that, uh, I would encourage you to go to my Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash RCWR show. You can find all the information in this very episode description here, but it's spelled P as in Paul, A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash RCWR show. Feel free to make a contribution to the show if you're able to do so on a monthly basis. That's great. Uh, or if you're able to make a one time donation, that's great. And you know, if you cannot donate, it's fine, man. Just feel free to share that link all throughout social media, especially if you're connected with me throughout social media. Feel free to, when you see it out, retweet it, share it. And word of mouth, man, spread the good word. If you like what I do for you guys every single week, make sure you spread the word. Let your friends, let your family know. Word of mouth, man, that's how you can do it. And if you haven't done so already, you can always leave ratings and reviews on Stitcher and on iTunes. Just use the keywords, the RCWR show. That's going to do it, guys. I will see you this Sunday for No Mercy, the after show. And then don't forget, your next regular edition of the RCWR show will come at you on Tuesday night, October 11th, 10 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker.com, right after SmackDown Live. Everybody be safe, be kind to one another. See you next go round. Take care.